All right, all right. How many of you guys are glad to be in the house of God tonight? Well, me too. It's been a long time since I've preached on a Wednesday night, and I'm pretty pumped about it. I'm not going to lie. So, yeah, I've got one fan. It's great. <laughs> Good thing there's Jesus in the mix because we would be in trouble. Uh, we are excited about uh, so many things coming up tonight. I was listening to that song tonight. I had no idea that they were going to sing You're Worthy of It All. Uh, because I have been uh, really going over a message in my heart that I wanted to deliver. And uh, I, I, I've been wanting to share it. And tonight, I'm actually going to share it. But it came out of a moment that I had with a sweet mentor of mine uh, when Brian and I went to Korea. And this was just a few weeks ago. We went to Korea and uh, we were at Dr. Paul Young Gi Cho's uh, memorial service uh, pastor of the largest church in the world for years and years and years. I think there might be one in Africa now that is surpassing the million members that Dr. Cho had in his Korean church, which is pretty impressive um, to just think about organizing one million people. So I have, uh, I have some kind of neurosis. I love organizational things and things that make things work and the systems behind everything. You know, most people just like the the stage part of it, but I really like to know, like, how in the world do you get one million people to take communion on the exact same day and make sure there are enough elements? Like, to me, that's very interesting. So uh, on one of the trips that we took to Korea, I'd been behind the scenes and gotten to see their systems and the way that they do things. And it's just mind blowing to watch what the kingdom of God can do in unity, you know? And so I was in Korea just the other day and there was an older pastor's wife um, and, and she's been a, just a very, very close friend of mine and a mentor for years and years. And some of you know her uh, husband, Dr. Morocco, has been here for so many times. And Dr. Morocco has, um, I think, 467 churches under his leadership now. And he's such a, an incredible apostle, really. I mean, just apostolic and from every fiber of his being. And his wife was beside me and I love his wife because she's like the total opposite of him. And she always has the right way to say something and something that sticks with me, but she's very funny and just very lighthearted. And so she couldn't walk very well. So Briley and I were with her trying to get her down this pathway. And um, it was very kind of a rough path. And I thought she was just gonna be focused on getting down this rough path because she was having a little bit of a hard time walking. Well, she was not focused on the path at all. So Briley and I were having to save her life every time that there was a rock because she was so busy preaching to me out of the passage, uh, out of uh, the message that I'm going to preach to you tonight. She was giving me this and she said, you know, Jesse, the other day, and I didn't have any idea they were going to lead this song tonight. She said, the other day I was singing, you're worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. And then she looked at me in Pastor Colleen's style and she said, but is he? I said, I didn't know if it was a trick question. I'm like, yes, ma'am. She said, yes, he is, honey. Even after 45 years, he is worthy of it all. She said, he's worthy of all of the good things. He's worthy of my worship. He's worthy of my offering. He's worthy of my tithe. He's worthy of my service. But she said, I was singing it with all of my heart, thinking I was pouring my heart out to God. And God spoke to me and he said, am I worthy of it all? Am I worthy of the pain? Or is that too much to give me? And she began to cry. And I just saw a woman that had served God for 45 years and laid her life down for the kingdom and for the people of God and for the things of God. I see a woman who'd given away every single thing that she owned two times in her life when she didn't know where her next meal was gonna come from and she laid it down before God. And she looked at me and she said, Jesse, is he really worthy of it all to you? Is he worthy of the pain, honey? Is he worthy? And man, it was just something I hadn't really thought about. I, I, I really hadn't had that encounter with God that way. And when she said it, it really just like hit me. And I saw it hit Briley, my daughter, and we were just both kind of standing there. And she said, I promise you, after all of these years, he's even worthy of the pain. And when she said it, it just really challenged me. 
that there was a place in God that I hadn't probably gotten to yet where I hadn't even considered that part. There's been a lot of pain, but I never ever thought of it in that way where it was like, I can give this offering to God that this, th this world has lavished pain on me, but if I can return it to God as an offering, then it changes the way that I look at him. It changes the way that I look at life. It changes the way I look at pain. It changes the way that I look at everything. Everything changes when he becomes worthy of not everything. No, he's not just worthy of everything. He's worthy of anything. And so tonight, I want you to get your notebooks out. I want you to get your Bible out. We're going to study a little bit tonight in the book of Matthew. But first, I want you to go to the, uh, to the book of Proverbs. Is he really worthy? As she finished that sentence, she looked at me and she said, Jesse, I want to talk to you about something. I said, okay, you just gave me a revelation that's really changing. My, like I was kind of going through it in my mind. She said, I want to talk to you about something. She said, is he worthy of everything? Is he worthy of our obedience? Is he worthy of walking it out in humility? Is he worthy of our humility? Or do we have so much pride that we can't enter into everything that God's called us to do? And I didn't really understand what she meant. She said, I wanna tell you something. Pride is the venom of the spirit tries to attach itself to everything and everybody in the kingdom of God. She said, pride comes after you. It is sin, but it comes through sin too. It, it is sin and it comes through sin. And then she said, pride is the venom of the spirit that has come to attack every Christian. And she said, but I have good news for you. Do you know what the anti-venom is? I said, no ma'am, but I'm about sure you're about to tell me, right? I said, no, I don't know what the anti-venom is. She said, pride is the venom of the spirit, but, hum uh, but she said, the church is the anti-venom. I said, how do you figure? She said, because the church strips every bit of pride away from you if you let it work right. <laughs> and if she is not fully schooled in church, nobody is. Because this woman has planted 467 churches up to date. She trains and teaches 467 pastors and their wives how to serve God in their current location. She has a lot of experience with the church. So my ears are open. She said the church is called by God to strip pride away. That's why God put us in it. Because if God can place us in the house of God, he can take the things of the kingdom and strip pride off of our life. Man, it just rocked my mind. I'm like, this is good stuff I'm getting today. And then she began to lead me through a few scripture verses as I'm gonna do for you tonight. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 tonight. I wanna read you a couple scriptures that really pinpoint pride. This is gonna be one that you're probably familiar with. If anyone brings up pride, this is usually the scripture that they use. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A lot of times you'll hear people say pride goes before a fall. They just kind of combine that scripture, but it's pride, go, uh, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I want you to turn just a page over to Proverbs 18, verse 12. Says it in a different way, but again, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is humility. So what we see in these two scriptures is that pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit goes before a fall. A haughty spirit also comes, uh, it says it again in, in that verse, it comes before destruction and before honor will come humility. I believe that God wants to lift his people up in honor. I, I believe God wants to take us to a place of honor. I believe that God wants his people to dwell in a place of honor all the time with all people and in that place favor be released in their life and, then, and they being able to then 
be lifted into a place of honor in the community. I believe 100% with all of my heart that Christian people should be the most loved people and the most honored people in a community that people know like that is a good person. That is a person you wanna be friends with. That is a person you wanna do business with. They're not shady, they're a person of honor. God wants to take us and put us in that place. And a lot of times in our culture right now, we are taught that if you want to be promoted to a place of honor, you must lift yourself. It's called self-promotion. 30 years ago, it was thought of in a very, very bad way. But today, because of the invent of social media, everybody is promoting themselves to a place of honor. And maybe or maybe they do not have what it takes to have honor. They just have already decided that their platform is theirs. They deserve it. They're going to own it and they're going to have it. So what we end up doing on social media, which is a part of our everyday world, and it is all encompassing around people, is that we give these people who have given themselves seats of honor a platform in our life that has never been earned, that has never been cut out of the rock. It's not an honor that comes through character. Character hasn't been built into them and now look at this. I mean, really honor should come whenever what? Whenever humility has been developed. That's the kingdom way. That when, when we go low, God is then able to put, to put us in a place of honor. But instead, as a culture, we like to promote ourselves before any character has been built to hold that thing up. So what we find is a lot of destruction because there's a lot of haughtiness around us. Say, Jesse, how do you combat that? I think we combat that with the church. I think we combat it through the kingdom. I think we combat it with the pride killer that is the church. Now listen, everything in the church is created to take pride out of you. Every spiritual discipline that God has ever implemented in the church is created to strip pride from your life. And I'm not talking about confidence. I love it when people are confident and I believe God does too. I mean, God wants you to believe in who he's made you to be. God looks at you and he, he, he puts favor on you for a reason and he promotes and he helps and he lifts. And I'm not taking any of that away, but as a person, it's really important that we understand like I'm a kingdom person. Therefore, the lower I can go, the higher in the kingdom God can take me. We're never too good to do anything anything in the kingdom of God. The easiest way to get removed from a staff at any campus at his church is to say that you cannot clean a toilet. Because <laughs> if you can't clean a toilet, you can't cast a devil out. There is nothing about this life that we give ourselves to the kingdom life that can withstand that kind of pride, that thing that says I'm too good for something. We're never too good for anything. We are the people that God has called that if, someone's, if someone wants us to go a mile with them, God's called us to go two. The world gets to go one mile and be a nice person, but you can't be a kingdom person until you're willing to go two for the ask of one. This is something that we don't really think about because in our world and in our time, we're just constantly promoting, constantly promoting, constantly promoting. Got to let people know what we're doing. Got to let people know what our, what, you know, what our side hustle is. We got to let people know. 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 And God's looking and saying, when will they just spend time here? And yet we think because we have a following that that promotes us to a place of honor, but it doesn't. It just promotes us to a place of destruction. And then we wonder why our young people in the kingdom don't understand the fullness of what it is to be a believer and why we're missing some things in our walk and in our time. And so when she said to me that the church was the anti-venom of the spirit, I'm like, man, I, I, I've got to figure this out. So I began to look. I want you to go with me in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to go to verse 15. Are you at Wednesday night church with your Bibles tonight? Do you have it on your phone? Do you have your notebook ready? Matthew 18, verse 15. I 
called Brian tonight. He was in the um, Owensboro campus, and I said, what are you preaching on? And he began to tell me, and then I told him what I was preaching on. He's like, we're preaching on the exact same thing. Both of us led by the Spirit to preach on pride and humility. Isn't that awesome? The Holy Spirit leads all, all of us. I love that. Matthew 18, verse 15 it says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more that by mouth, the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word might be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector put out from among you. I was looking at this scripture because right before it, it says, if your eye offends you, cut it out. If your foot offends you, cut it off. If your hand offends you, cut it off. And I'm like, man, this is extreme. You know, like it, how many of you have ever sinned with your eye? just get it plucked out. Like, I mean, that's intense, right? It's like this next move is going to be a big one. People wait for it, pluck it out. I mean, that's, that's like, is so intense the way that it's said and where the way that it's worded. But what it's saying is if you already know that something you are doing, that it's causing you to stumble in sin and you're, off you're offended by that action, that it would be better for you to do without that thing, to go ahead and cut it off of your life than to live with it there offending. So what God's saying in the scriptures before this is, if you know you have a problem, take care of yourself. If you know you're offensive, stop it. If you know you're sinning, quit it. And then it goes on to say, now let's talk about how to deal with each other in the church. Don't you guys think that's a good thing to learn? Because if we treat each other in the church, like we treat each other in the bank, it won't be kingdom. So God gives us very real instructions on what to do inside the body of Christ. It says, if your brother has come against you and, and, and sinned against you, that the right thing to do is to go to them and to say to them, you have offended me. Now the Bible also says this, it says that if, that if you love the word, you won't be easily offended. Sometimes because we haven't cut our arm plucked out our eye, cut our hand off or our foot off, we're still getting offended all the time because there's sin that's just stopping us constantly from being able to flow in the kingdom flow. So first God says, take care of your own sin. But then if there's something that you don't mind the whole church knowing every detail about and you can't get past it, and you're willing to go to the ends of the earth to fix it. And it is a relationship with a brother and sister in Christ. This doesn't mean someone walked by you and gave you a dirty look. And now it's your turn to tell them what you think about them. No, 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 no. It's like we're having a, an issue here, a relational issue. And it is so deep and so important that I am willing to go to every link to fix it because you're a brother and sister in Christ. And I am willing to even take my own actions in front of the entire body. That would cut that off real quick. We don't want to talk about us. We want to talk about them, right? Even then it's talking about you go to that person, you share it with them. Then you go and you take someone uh, that, and I want to give you some pastoral advice. Don't take your mama because she thinks you're the best. That's not fair. Like you offended me and my mama's here to deal with you. Like, come on, be an adult. Have enough wisdom as the mama to not go with them. Say, yes, honey, you should deal with that. Now take someone who's a neutral party in the kingdom and, and take them in. Not a sinner, not someone that doesn't serve Jesus at all. Someone who knows the kingdom and the kingdom principles. And you take them with you and you say, listen, I really want to work this out. This doesn't mean you have to be best friends at the end of the conversation. It doesn't mean that they have to join your small group to make you happy. It doesn't mean that you have to live in tight quarters with them or you got to move them in with your family or eat Thanksgiving dinner with them. It just means that you are willing at all costs to dwell in unity in the body. And so you're willing to expose you. You're willing to do whatever it takes. You take a friend. If that doesn't work, it says take them to the church. That actually means the leaders of the church. So a leader in the body of Christ somewhere that you can get a hold of that, hey, could you help us work through this? 
And then if they just refuse to come into unity with you, then it's probably time to just put them out of, out of your world and just continue to walk with Jesus. That doesn't say that if they refuse to agree with you. It doesn't say if they refuse, you know, it, it's not an ultimatum where you get your way or they're a heathen. Inside the kingdom of God, we have to be willing to humble ourselves, to come into humility in front of someone and say, I've seen it many, many times done wrong, and I've seen it very few times done right. And when it is done right, it is one of the most beautiful things that you will ever see inside the kingdom of God. People humbling themselves and saying, listen, I didn't even mean to do that, but you are right. I could see how that would be offensive to you. And I would like to apologize because I believe that God wants us to dwell in unity more than I want my own way. You're right. I didn't understand that kingdom principle that you're telling me right now that I stepped over the line on. I didn't even know that line was there and I just trampled all on it. And man, I'm learning something today. I'm getting stronger in God. I'm becoming a better believer. Please help me learn. I love it. I've seen it so many times. I, I actually thought of a, of a crazy instance today. You don't know any of these people, so it's totally safe. I was really young and I was pastoring in Owensboro and there were these um, twins. Let me tell you something. If you're a twin in here, you're, I'm just telling you, twins are different. No matter how they act, they always still have a friend. You gotta watch twins, they're crazy. If you're a twin, I love you. I'm teasing. It's just a joke. You can come to me afterward, bring your friend, bring your mama, whoever. I'll apologize. There was these two twins, and they were just cute as buttons. I mean, they're just, everybody loved them. They were so happy and so sweet, and they were just all friendly with everybody and just the cutest little things. And everybody just, oh, and they're like, their names went together, and they were just little single girls in their 20s, you know. And I just thought they were just precious. And then I went into a meeting with one of them and there was this little girl, she was a little bit emotional. She was in our, in our college age group and I knew she was tender. You know, people, some people are tender, that's okay. Just let them be tender, just love them anyway. And she wasn't real demanding. She never, I mean, she didn't ask for a lot, but she said, uh, you know, Pastor Jesse, is there any way that you would go with me to these girls because I used to be a part of their friend group and then all of a sudden one day they just both decided that they don't want anything to do with me and they go out and they do everything and they will not invite me and all of my friends are their friends and I'm just getting cut out and I believe this is my church and I really think I'm supposed to be a part of that friend group and I'm willing to apologize for anything. If they'll tell me what I did to them, I'll repent. I don't want to have anything against them and I don't want them to have anything against me. If they'll just tell me and I said, have you already gone to them? Yes, ma'am. Have you already taken a friend? Yes, ma'am, we've had multiple conversations. I said, okay, all right, I'll go with you. So we set up a time, we sat down. And I'm telling you what, the demon came out of this chick. I have never seen anything like it. This one sensitive girl's telling her what she's done and this woman just starts spewing venom. And it was nothing like you did this. It was just like, we don't like you because you have a terrible personality and you're ugly and you're, I mean, she was just going after this chick. And I'm like, whoa, what in the world is that? Like, this is like this sweet little bebop Christian girl that just, I thought she was just all cute and sweet. She was not cute. She was not sweet. There was nothing about her cute, nothing about her sweet. I mean, we were like 10 minutes in and this girl's just shredded to pieces and she's just living her best life because she's still got a friend to go home to. And I said, can I share with you, like, I'm a little blown away right now. I, I don't think there's anything that anybody can come up with. It's like a massive thing. Well, it sounds like she got one of your friends that you didn't want her to have. And well, she liked that friend and it's a free country. And wow, I, I mean, I'm stunned. I'm just like trying, right? I'm wrapping my brain around it, just trying. And I said, uh, the Bible says that if, you refuse to forgive someone that God isn't able to forgive you. She said, then I guess that I'm just going to go to hell because I'm never doing it. And when she said it, I was just like, <laughs> I kept thinking if I had Jesse, pick your job, Jesse, pick your job, Jesse, pick your job. Wasn't working for me. Nope. 
full-fledged just stunned. I could not believe that it was happening. We were in the sanctuary of the house of God with a girl that has known Jesus for 20 years, I thought, and she doesn't have one unifying bone in her body, not one thing that would rip that pride veil off of her life and cause the people of God to dwell together in unity. And I said, you need to think about what you just said. That's a very serious thing to tell God that you don't care if he forgives you, you're not going to ever forgive her. I said, I mean, there are people that have had major offense. They've been raped, pillaged, plundered. I mean, they've gone through real life stuff. This girl just was friends with your friend too. I'm like, sister, please do not get married. You're gonna die in that marriage. She said, I'm just here to tell you that I do not care what happens to me and God can do whatever he wants to me. I will never forgive her. And I said, okay, I think we're at the end of Matthew 18. I feel like we've done everything we can do, so we'll just let the Holy Spirit deal with her now. And we released her to go do whatever she needed to do between her and the Lord. That was stunning to me. Because how many of you know that is not how believers are called to be? But you know, I've sat in meetings where people shared their heart with somebody and it was the silliest thing in the world. And honestly, I couldn't even believe we were having a meeting over it. Sometimes the most serious thing in the world and they had deeply hurt someone. I've been with people that should have probably gotten a divorce over what happened. I've sat in meetings with women who were impregnated by they didn't know who as the seventh child in their family and their husbands have looked across the way at them and said, I choose to forgive you. I lay down my pride and today I pick up humility. And it is the, I mean, some of the most supernatural, mind-blowing moments have been one-on-one -on -one meetings where people took great deep sin and set it aside. In fact, in that same meeting with that young lady who was pregnant with someone that he didn't even know, she'd just been meeting up with some guy in a hotel. He'd been married to her for 15 years. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Jesse, if you knew what I had done to God, you would know I can't hold this against her. And I was blown out of the water because if I would have been him, it would have been like, you're done, sister. And something inside of him rose up. Sometimes when we lay pride down and we pick up the anti-venom of the spirit, which is that shield that comes on top of us when everything in hell is coming at us, when every fiery dart is, is headed our direction, when we choose to do things God's way. It wasn't even something that I believe he was required to do scripturally. And yet he chose unity over pride. Every spiritual discipline will do this to you, prayer. Prayer will absolutely strip pride out of your life. The closer you get to Jesus, pride will fall off like scales. The more time you spend with God, and I don't mean like on the street, like praying in front of everyone, like the Bible says, you know, like the Pharisees do out loud, looking all good. That's not the kind of, I'm talking about that heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, like deep prayer where you meet with God and he exposes parts of you that you don't even want God to look at. That is where God will heal and lift you and he will strip pride out of your life. Service in the church strips pride. I watch in the Owensboro campus Every week, there's a group of men who are like CEOs, the, some of the greatest men in our community. One of them had uh, employed 6,000 people. One ran the third largest insurance agency in the state of Kentucky. Multiple, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, and there's like five or six of them. And every single week on that one day, those men get together and they clean that church. We don't pay a penny to have that church cleaned. And I look at it and I'm like, Brian has even said to them, he's like, you could teach our young man, men how to do business. Like, could you please come out of the bathroom? And, and like, you're so good. And they said, we're tired of bossing people around. We're just happy serving Jesus. That's what the house of God will do. It'll strip that, that anti-venom of the spirit. Giving. 
Man, God gave me a revelation the other day. I hear people all the time, you know, they say, you're not supposed to do certain things in public, like pray out loud and be like the Pharisees. Like, uh, but we talk about this during January because we do like the fast. So it's like, well, we don't, you know, we shouldn't fast, but there are corporate fasts in scripture. I think it's both and, I don't think it's and or. So there's like prayer that you, you know, don't do in public. And then there's somebody has to lead corporate prayer, you know, so there's got to be a humility there and just, uh, uh, okay, God, we're going to do it corporately. And in the same scripture, it talks about uh, fasting. And so there's fasting that you do corporately. We see that um, explained in scripture. So we know it's there, but then also God says that you shouldn't, uh, you know, fast for everyone to see and look downtrodden and, you know, try to put your sackcloth and ashes on and like, make sure your breath is as bad as it can be. And like, let everybody know that you're just, oh, it's such a terrible Thursday because I'm fasting today. That's what God's talking about. In prayer, you know, he says, don't pray out loud like the Pharisees. And then in the next like chapter over, he'll say, when you get up to pray, cover your head or do, you know, so it's like, okay, it, which one is it? Well, it's and, it's both and, not and or, right? So we see the same thing in giving. And a lot of people say, you know, you should never give in public. Only we see corporate giving in scripture in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira. 100% giving in public in a corporate gift whenever they lie and they drop dead. That's bad. You don't want to do that. Okay. We all, we all got that story. That's one that sticks with you, right? But then it also says in scripture, not to let your right hand know what your left hand's doing whenever you give alms. Humility. Well, alms is actually not corporate giving. It's not across the board giving. Alms is giving to the poor. So for years, I've believed 100% and still believe today that God does that to protect the dignity of the one who needs the gift. So we, what do we do? We don't let everyone know, oh, we gave to that person because they're having a hard time right now and point it out and make a big deal out of it and post it on social media and like take a selfie with the homeless man that you're helping that day. That's not God's will. But I also believe it's not just to protect the dignity of the poor. That instruction is given to us to protect the humility of the one who has the money. Because it's really, really tempting when you have the money to give to want to determine where it goes, who it goes to, to put your name on it, to put your plaque on it, to put your stone on the wall, to let everybody know I did this and God loves you too much to let you fall into that pride. And so he puts a shield in front of you called the church. And that's why God says to give, not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. That doesn't mean you can't get tax purposes. That means you're not announcing to the world, look at what I've done. It means that you are giving with the shield of the church in front of you to veil your humanity and to lift the name of Jesus. So that when that person gets that gift, if the church is functioning right, it's flowing out of the church and they're like, man, God did that for me. The church did that for me as a whole. And look who, look at this. They, God loves me and the church loves me. I should go to church. I should give my heart to Jesus. I should get involved. And then God is then able to teach and lift that person into the future that he's called them to have. But if we only say it's the dignity of the poor, let's protect the dignity of the poor. And we don't realize that it's the pride of the rich that needs to be guarded as well then somehow it's always, oh, look what those people are doing. Oh, that's nice that you help those people. I want to put my name on that orphanage. I want to do this and I want everybody to know that I, but God's like, uh-uh, uh-uh, I love you too much. I'm going to reroute that pride. We're going to get over here behind the veil of the anti-venom and we're going to let unity arise in your life. Every spiritual discipline is connected to this. Humility baptism, how much humility comes from being dunked under the water and coming up all wet and crazy, especially for you Texas girls, because it's like lashes and hair everywhere. When Texas girls get baptized, there's like a film on top of the water when they get out. Listen, they have lotion, makeup, lash, and done that hair. So, I mean, there's so much hairspray in that water when we finish. It's not like having baptism in Colorado. Their water's clean when they get out. In Texas, we got like a film that thick. Those Texas girls do it upright, right? 
But there's a humility that comes with the shedding of the physical layer and the adoration of God himself. Takes away pride. And it instills a fear of the Lord, a love for the presence of God, a holiness that you have humbled yourself under the hand of God that you might be lifted up. That's the difference in God's way and our way. I want you to go to verse 21 in the same chapter. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. And Jesus says, I do not say to you, up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That's a lot. And some of you people are pushing the numbers up. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle those accounts, he had agreed with the laborers of a, den a denarius a day. He sent them into his vineyard and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. Hey, wait a second. I think I'm on the wrong one. 18 verse 21. There we go. Jesus said to him, if you want, uh, ah, I can't find it, guys. I'm getting... I'm, I'm over 40. My eyes aren't doing right. 18 verse 21. Here we go. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often? There we go. And when he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he uh, was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all that I, that I owe you. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him. And forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and he threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you. I think this is really real. If we don't see ourselves in this scripture, I don't think we're going to see ourselves in any scripture. You owed God everything. And he came down and paid the price for you and forgave you. And then we walk to the next person that's just a human being and we ask them to pay back what they owe to us, that forgiveness, that attitude, that whatever. We ask something of them and they say, please, for, uh, please forgive my debt. I don't have what it takes. And we're like, that's it. You're going to jail. Like literally five minutes before the master had forgiven him everything and set him up for success. And he walks straight out of that encounter and demands that a small portion of money be paid back to him now. And when the guy begs him for forgiveness, he tells him to go away. And he sends him and makes him pay his price. How many of you know that Jesus has been the best debt payer of all time? And I am in no way, no shape, no form saying that every single person who does something to you, the minute you forgive them, they have to come right back into your life. Someone just robbed your house last night and you just have to say, you know what, I forgive you. Here's a key. Come on in anytime. I don't believe that. But I do believe that there is a place of forgiveness and unity and wholeness and laying down our pride and picking up the ways of God in the kingdom that as Christian believers, if we don't learn to walk in, that our maturity will never come. How many of you wanna be mature in your faith? You wanna be mature believers. You don't just wanna be like half-hearted or you don't wanna just stay toddlers for the rest of your walk with Jesus. We should be growing, we should be blooming, we should be fulfilling the call of God. 
And we have to learn to deal with each other if we're ever going to do what God's asked us to do. How do we think that God is going to convict us about something in our life and we're going to repent and lay down our pride? If in, how do we think that that's going to happen in this super spiritual way if our brother and sister in Christ can't even come to us and say, you have hurt me and we lay down our pride when a physical voice says it? and say, man, I'd like to ask you to forgive me for hurting you. If we can't deal with each other, how will we ever deal here? God gives us brothers and sisters in Christ to sharpen us, to make us more like Jesus. I tell my children, you're welcome. I gave you a sibling. You now get to develop negotiation skills. You're gonna be better because I gave you a sibling. Did you know God has given you siblings? All over this room tonight, you have siblings and God is saying to you, you are welcome. I am about to give you kingdom negotiation skills. You're gonna to learn to love, to stretch, to give, to pour, to help, to lift, to humble yourself. Some of you haven't been able to say to somebody, hey, you offended me and I just need to talk with you about it and I'm not gonna hold it against you. I just need, and I don't mean they did something that's petty. I mean something that you need to get fixed because the kingdom depends on it. Some of us aren't willing to lay down our pride and humble ourselves to even say that our heart could ever be hurt. I don't care what that person thinks, I got friends. That's kind of our attitude most of the time, but the thing is, if we're gonna dwell together, they hurt my kid, Jesse, it's different, they hurt my kid. That's different, they could have done anything to me, but now they hurt my kid. If I, could, if I had a dollar for every time I've pastored that comment. Listen, we've gotta teach our children to walk out forgiveness. We gotta teach our grandchildren to walk out forgiveness. We, we gotta walk people through, we gotta have conversations in our households, in our living room, with our spouse. Listen, I'm married to Brian Gibson. I'm a professional at this. And he is a professional as well. Do you know why? Because we are human beings that have fault and have sin and have disagreement and have attitudes and have incredible opinions and have strong wills and have beliefs and have loves and have passion and have gifts and all the things mixed up into one big swirly kingdom smoothie and God wants to use you to make it palatable to the world. He wants to bring the kingdom into your house. How many of you want that for your life tonight? Will you stand up? I hope this teaching walks with you through the next few years of your Christianity. Hopefully it'll walk with you till you die. You'll remember, man, I owe it to Jesus to walk out forgiveness and humility. I owe it to God for pride to fall off. And I owe it to myself to live fully in this kingdom life that God has provided for me so graciously. Let's lift a hand to heaven if you need that tonight. Maybe God's even stirring in you something. You can have a talk with someone or there's something. I don't, I don't want this to become some big accusation fest. Let me tell you. But some of you, you really need a minute with God right now. You need to ask God to forgive you. And you need to ask God to help you walk in love. There might be an uncomfortable conversation that has to be had, but you gotta be willing to humble yourself too and you're not ready for that. Let's let God make us ready tonight. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, right now, I pray that the kingdom would come even closer to us than it has been before. God, that it wouldn't just come around us in the presence of God in this room, but it would come into our heart, into our life, into our conversation, into our relationship, that the kingdom of God would be made great because the people of God are being made greater. Father, I thank you that as we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that Father, you would cause us in due season to be lifted to any place that you need us to serve and shine. But until that time, God, we would just be willing to be made willing to do your will in every area. Father, make us humble in our service. Make us humble in our giving. Make us humble in our interactions. Make us humble in our prayer. Make us humble in our fasting. God, teach us. Teach us better tonight. In Jesus' name, I bless their families. I say that they're the head and never the tail above only, and they are never beneath. In Jesus' name.